Let me be perfectly honest with you. I'm getting a little tired of the constant notes that I've been getting from angry viewers for quite some time now on why haven't I discussed the two main early European VCRs. Well, uh, the VCRs in question being the Philips N series, uh, aka the N1500, aka the Philips VCR, and the Philips Video 2000, aka the V2000. In a nutshell, they were irrelevant. Now that I've pissed off the entire continent of Europe, let me expand on that statement. Format Wars was intended to be from a North American point of view, and as such, if it didn't have an NTSC variant, and uh, if it didn't have at least a slated NTSC variant, it didn't get discussed. So, and then I know you're gonna say, well then why'd you discuss the Telefunk and TED? Well, the TED was slated for an NTSC release, and it was intended to be a competitor to the RCA Select Division. But Telefunken pulled out because we kind of already had the Betamax and VHS thing going on around the time that they would have been putting it out, and RCA just hadn't quite finished the uh, good old Select Division yet. In fact, they wouldn't get that on the market till 81. But it's still relevant because it was a would-be competitor. And as for the Philips stuff, it really wasn't. I've heard anecdotally that the N-Series had a test NTSC run, but I can't find so much as a single picture on it. I can't find a reliable source. All I found is Wikipedia and an unsighted Wikipedia article on that, and as such, I'm not discussing it. And either way, it, it was a non-entity, no matter how you slice it. So, there you go. And of course, the Video 2000 was never meant for, and as such, was never released in an NTSC version. So, there's that. So, hopefully, to make everybody happy, let's take this episode and just discuss the two main early European VCRs. We'll get this little non-controversy taken care of. Nice of you to drop in, love. Oh, and you've missed your football on TV. Anything for you, Mum. Oh, you are a good boy. Bye. When you have a Philips television recorder, you don't have to miss anything. First up, we've got the Philips video cassette recording, or VCR, system. Philips released the N1500 VCR in 1972. And on the surface, the Philips VCR appeared to be a competitor to the Sony U-Matic. And that wouldn't be entirely untrue. Granted, the U-Matic was aimed more at broadcast and industrial use, but it still had some, if you will, domestic models. The Philips VCRs were aimed more at the educational market, but it also had some domestic models. Also, like U-Matic, at the time of initial release, tape running time maxed out at one hour. However, unlike the U-Matic, Philips VCR cartridges didn't break the one-hour mark until the VCR LP variant came around circa 1977, peaking at around two and a half hours. And around that time, Grundig introduced the Super Video, or SV, VCR variant, peaking at four hours, and those machines were rarely compatible with standard VCR tapes. You've already got a screen, just here. What it does have, though, among other things, is a tape deck, just like an ordinary audio tape recorder's got, but this one records pictures as well. The design of the VCR cartridge is akin to that of the American Cartrivision format. The cartridge itself is a nearly cubic design with the two tape spools resting on top of one another. Unsurprisingly, also like Cartrivision, it's not unusual for tapes to run off course and wind tied up inside the cartridge, or worse yet, inside the deck. Philips and Cartrivision units also both employed an internal timer so that viewers could set up recordings while they're away. Both units also had an optional wired video camera so that people could make home movies, as long as it was within 8 feet of the VCR. Conversely, as the Philips VCR wasn't really meant all that much for domestic use, pre-recorded titles never really happened for the VCR like they did for Cartrivision. 
On a happier note, inserting a Cartrivision tape into its deck was almost akin to dropping your tape into a safe deposit box, whereas inserting the VCR tape into the deck was a lot closer to that of the more familiar, well, just about any other VCR in the world. More importantly, the quality of the Cartrivision was kinda lousy, whereas the Philips VCR was closer to, if not a little better than, the Sony U-Matic. Unlike the Cartrivision, there were no skip field recording techniques or any other little technological corners cut. So don't hang about, make the most of the Golden Jubilee offers while they last, at Williams. Where else? Introducing Spin Slicer by Ronco, the fancy food cutter. Like the U-Matic, the cost of the unit, not to mention tapes for it, were a bit much for the average consumer. The original 1972 Philips N1500 unit cost, depending on your source, anywhere from 450 to 600 British pounds, the highest number equivalent to about 5,800 pounds in 2014, with tapes running at around 14 to 15 pounds each, or around 140 pounds in 2014. The time is now. The company is Philips, and the system is the Video 2000. Wanting a piece of the then-emerging, consumer-targeted rise of explicit home video formats, Philips pulled the plug on the N-Series in 1979. Arriving about two years late to the Betamax VHS format war, Philips replaced the N-Series with the Video 2000, or V2000. It was introduced in 1979, and to me looks, frankly, uninspiring. Borrowing from the design of a standard audio cassette, V2000 tapes were two-sided, allowing double recording time, usually peaking at eight hours, but as a result, only allowing for half the bandwidth of the next biggest home video format. The final V2000 units, released in the mid to late 80s, offered half speed, or XL mode, allowing for a quite impressive 16 hours of potential record time. However, as I hinted, like the competing VHS, the quality was a good step down from the VCR format, or U-Matic, or Betamax. The V2000 employed what was known as Dynamic Track Following, or DTF, supposedly negating the need for tracking control, but as all too many surviving V2000 tapes and decks show, maybe tracking control wouldn't have been such a bad idea. In particular, like the ancient Sony CV2000, playback quality tended to vary a lot between individual units. Like the DTF function, the V2000 did employ a few innovations, but in my opinion, they're not that impressive. The V2000 introduced automatic rewind, soon matched by VHS and beta, and an audio filter to reduce tape hiss. In my opinion, the only real plus that the V2000 offered was the ability to give a fairly noise-free freeze frame. Things like hi-fi sound, not to be confused with linear stereo, and auto-reverse were slated to be introduced for the V2000, but never were, which was kind of the story of the format's life. And while the lowly VHS may not have been as sexy to the video snob as the V2000, VHS offered more features and did so more accessibly, both in cost and availability. Also by the standards of the time, the V2000 was still a cost-prohibitive format. In 1980, when a VHS unit ran for about $700, or in the neighborhood of 450 to 500 British pounds, a V2000 ran for around 650 pounds, a gap that never really narrowed. Unable to compete with VHS, the V2000 ceased production in 1988. I love my viewers, I really do, but please... Stop sending me your angry notes on these VCRs. Well, that's it for today's archive. Join us next time when I start a nice bonfire to get rid of these things.
Thank you.